Good afternoon. I'm Rick Echevarria from Intel. I'm responsible for product security across all of our businesses, clients, data center, IoT, artificial intelligence, autonomous driving, all the different businesses that Intel is participating in. Blockchain is a very interesting workload and one that we came across uh, over three years ago when we started looking at cryptocurrencies and the cost of compute and the opportunities for compute for cryptocurrencies. Just like many on this journey, we realized that there was something interesting about that underlying technology behind the cryptocurrencies, which is the blockchain. And when we looked at blockchain, we started looking at a number of technology challenges that we, that we realized long-term blockchains were going to have. You heard earlier from Rojas about the amount of compute that uh, Bitcoin requires. We realized that long-term, if we were going to be able to leverage blockchain for digital transformation, we weren't going to be able to deploy it at that cost of compute. So that's one of the first areas that we started looking at. Second, we realized that um, there were some issues around privacy and security for blockchains that we had a number of technologies that were uniquely suited to address these. So what we decided to do is we went ahead and started building our own distributed ledger technology, right, which powers blockchains, Hyperledger Sawtooth. And in looking at that workload, we realize and we inform ourselves on changes that we can make to our silicon roadmap to make and to power blockchains in a way that would be scalable, secure, and private. So it's interesting that people want to spend a little bit too much time on hype versus not hype. For us, that doesn't really matter. Our job is to make it ha ma happen, to make blockchain real. And you, should you choose to deploy blockchains, we are going to, through our work and through the work with our partners, enable you to run the most scalable, the most secure, and the most with privacy built-in blockchains that you can run. And so um, I'll stop here, but as we go through the panel, I'll try to spend, uh, spend a little bit of time explaining to you exactly what I mean when I say that we have a combination of software and hardware technologies that enable that scale, that enable that privacy, and that enable that security. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I handle uh, innovation and fintech investments at Isaiza Bank. Uh, so we are one of the, I think, the only bank which, uh, you know, pivoted the first transaction, you know, using blockchain on, you know, remittance and the trade transaction. So we had partnered with uh, ENBD and we developed a custom-made application and we did this entire, both the transaction on the, you know, that platform. Now, we are focusing on our energies in terms of how do we scale up. So there are a lot more POCs and use cases which are being discussed, but the major uh, focus should come in now in terms of scaling it up. And apart from the uh, trade in remittance, uh, which is, you know, core to the uh, any bank, there are a couple of use cases which we are toggling with in terms of, and those are, some of them are internal and some of them are, you know, external. So during the course of our discussion, I'll highlight in terms of what are the other use cases which uh, where blockchain can be used and immense benefit can be derived out of it. Forest payments, trade finance, I mean, these are areas which are kind of like, you know, you could say uh, inherently, uh, you know, well suited for uh, blockchain application. Uh, you know, anything that you may want to share as, uh, as a process that you follow, Hitesh, in terms of, uh, you know, how you identify, you know, where to apply blockchain. Because, right, I mean, for some time, uh, I think it is always looking like blockchain was a great solution that was looking for a problem, all right? So how do you how do you identify the areas where uh, you want to apply blockchain, uh, you know, across your enterprise? So interesting, I think. So I'll, uh, so I'll go back to what, you know, Roa said that blockchain will not be able to solve everything. But yeah, definitely there are a couple of, you know, use cases where we found that blockchain would have a fantastic, you know, impli you know post implementation it can derive you know, a result into huge benefits. So one of the areas we, when we thought that, you know, as banks we have the traditional uh, IT systems and largely disconnected ones. And most of the time the problem arises about reconciliations amongst those systems. So that where we realized that, you know, uh, technology like blockchain, most of the time we keep talking about creating networks with uh, 
other banks or outside the bank network. But here, we thought that blockchain can be of immense use while reconciliation is a major problem across the banking segment. Anywhere and, and, where and, there is a reconciliation. Uh, any, any, anywhere, right? yeah. yeah. And yeah, it, it can be enterprise-wide problem which can be solved using it. So that was one of the use case which you know emerged while we had this discussion that what else we can you know put it on the blockchain because when you talk to external uh, network, it takes a lot of time to bring people on board. Uh, it at times it requires regulatory approvals. So we thought that while we continue our journey in terms of experimenting and scaling up the uh, use cases outside our uh, you know ecosystem, but within ecosystem, like we have uh, branches, overseas branches, we have subsidiaries. Now all this you know can there's a clear cut case for you know taking them on the blockchain and you know reap that benefit. So that's how we have uh, for our the strategy and approach is twofold. Like one is create as many external networks and uh, you know uh, uh, build use cases with the help of the external networks and simultaneously keep identifying use cases for internal uh, you know purpose also like in an s bank because you don't have to convince your your internal staff right you know you you are inherently modern you know you don't have the problem of uh, probably you don't have as many uh, you could say legacy, legacy systems and issues to solve you don't have mindsets to change in a, in a sense, right? You you know you have the tick mark. You just say yes, yes. Let's get get it done, right? So uh, given that context, but you still have the regulator, uh, you know, and uh, you still have to play within the regulatory regime. You know, how how do you how do you juggle this? You know, bringing together a technology, its regulatory aspect, uh, and of course, uh, what the regulator wants in terms of they themselves driving absorption of technology. Sure, Vic. So I'll I'll, I'll come to that yeah. regulator part of it. Just uh, add a little bit first in terms of what we are doing in terms of, of course. blockchain yeah. uh, share. As I said, the way we operate is is we pick up the industry problem, or or a customer problem, and and then come up with the technology solution to the pro, uh, to to the uh, customer. So uh, so we have built uh, uh, a supply chain uh, platform or uh, a solution onto the blockchain platform. Now, what was the problem statement? The problem statement was that. We have our customers who are, and big corporates are customers, and they have their suppliers uh, 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 who provide materials to them. Now, the challenge with, with, with the suppliers who provide materials to our, our customers, like say, for example, Bajaj Electrical, uh, when, when their uh, 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 vendors provide them, you know in, in Indian industry, uh, the general credit period is 30 days to 90 days for them to receive the payment. So that's the first uh, 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 problem statement for the vendors. Second is when, when an, an order is awarded to them, they also need a working capital at that point in time. Now, the standard way or, or, or the manual way of doing this in, in the banking side is that the vendor will go to the uh, various bank and show that I'm getting this order from so-and-so uh, uh, principal and here is my purchase order, please give me finance. And when he raises the invoice, uh, it takes another seven to 10 days for a bank to uh, uh, fund him. So generally, a credit period for, a, for small vendors is nothing less than 107 days. So we picked wow. up this problem. So we mm. picked up this problem and we say how we can reduce it to, to uh, instant uh, uh, solution. So what we did was we tried- and The vendor is really short of cash. Absolutely, right? yeah. absolutely. Because yeah. who, who wants to wait for 90 days or yeah. 107 days to receive the, the payment for the invoice which they have raised. So what we did was we worked with Bajaj Electricals. We picked up their vendors uh, in, in that. We build up uh, uh, entire uh, uh, cha supply chain uh, with Bajaj uh, uh, Electricals on, our, on, on the blockchain platform, wherein we were on nodes, Bajaj was on node, and their vendors were on node. Uh, the process was entire transparent. That's one of the key uh, features of, of blockchain. Purchase order raised by Bajaj Electrical on the vendor is it's available on the blockchain. Uh, vendors uh, uh, confirming the deliveries of, of, to, of to that. Vendor raising and invoices are also available to that. Now what we have done is, in addition to blockchain, we have integrated uh, uh, with APIs the entire uh, our core banking system and the payment system with the blockchain. So the way it works is for a banker like us, it's transparent that here is a vendor who has a confirmed order from Bajaj Electrical who's already delivered the good, which means he's a kind of a almost 100% a, a uh, uh, pure customers who's, go, who's going to pay back. So, so, so we immediately kind of uh, uh, disperse, we do a vendor financing on their invoicing on the invoices and then disperse that money on the same day he raises the invoice with, with that. So he doesn't mm. have to run around 
uh, 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 to, to get it done, what is it? So that was one of the biggest use case which we did, and this is working pretty well, and this is going to grow. So we partnered with, with uh, uh, we use IBM uh, Hyperledger uh, Fabric as, as a platform on, on this. Uh, we haven't grown, we haven't gone beyond, we haven't kind of, I would say, with lots of other customers, we haven't gone this, primarily because Hyperledger was still on, on a dot six version, and uh, as of a couple of months back, they have, have operationalized on 1.0, which is yeah. production class kind of a, a hyperledger fabric. So we would do that. So that's one stream. Second stream, obviously, we are we we are we have worked on on with Ripple's is another hyper uh, kind of a, a ledger platform, uh, uh, Ripple, which is for the cross border remittance. Uh, this is uh, again, uh, as we know, India is one of the biggest corridor for inward remittance for for the money across any part of the world. We Indians are there in any part of the world. So obviously the money comes back. So over there we have uh, built, uh, uh, along with Ripples, we have partnered with them, we have built a node with the, at our end. Uh, and anybody who is uh, sending money from a peer bank uh, who is on the Ripple uh, network, he can provide a, a, a credit straight away to the beneficiary instantaneously. Today, while we say what's new in that, so today even if you want to pay money, let's say if my daughter is studying in, in, in uh, US and if I want to pay her fees, it still takes two days for me through Swift to reach that money into her account. Here, or the vice versa when it comes in, on, on the Ripple platform, you can immediately kind of a transfer the money in the beneficiary account before you leave the counter. So that's another uh, use case which we're working on. The third one is the, uh, we are working again uh, with uh, ICICI and another on, on the uh, trade finance uh, blockchain. Coming back to your questions on... So on these, are, these are cases where you have to work towards an ecosystem. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the power comes in the ecosystem. Uh, it comes really. in... So the first one, as I said, is a purely an internal. It's a permissible but it, uh, internal uh, one wherein we work with our... So we are primarily while uh, a proper bank, but we are a huge focus on corporate side. So that's a huge business case for, for us. So and then we'll be able to solve some problem for us and generate a business for, for us. So that's one ecosystem. Coming back to your question on the regulator front, so uh, uh, IDRBT, who is uh, uh, yeah. arm of uh, RBI, who who uh, who's our regulator in the bank side. In fact, uh, I was just reading the white paper which they have published. So they have already started, I would say, a year and a half back uh, uh, in terms of their research, their entire study about blockchain. They have already started trade finance POCs internally on, on them. I had met with them personally three weeks back, uh, not three weeks, three months back, uh, uh, wherein we uh, all CIOs, uh, even um, ICAC, HDFC, we wanted to understand why, where, uh, uh, what's the view of uh, regulators. They have a very positive view. They have a very positive view on, on blockchain and they want to keep on adopting new technologies as well. Having said that, being a regulator, they have to kind of thok baja ke, dekhenge from all angles <laughs> before yeah. they kind of say, okay, good to go. So uh, very positive approach from regulators, uh, but I still foresee, as you rightly said, three to four years until it becomes a mainstream application in uh, and commonly used application in the banking side. And banking will be one of the I would say first big use case coming down because we adopt technologies uh, like blockchain very or quickly. pretty quickly. Yeah. Great, great. And, and Rick, of course, you know, for those of us who are in technology, if something's going to happen three years from now, we've got to start today, right? Uh, and I think if, if this kind of scale is going to come, particularly when we talk, uh, you know, ecosystems, uh, you know, uh, I, I was with a bank uh, last week. We are talking to some MNC banks uh, related to blockchain. And uh, if it takes off, we are talking about doing something in 27 countries, right? No, not not like in, you know, in, no, not like across two, three institutions because yeah. that's where the real power of the whole technology comes in. And, uh, you know, what would you, you know, like to comment on what you are doing and what the industry is doing in order to deliver that kind of scale where it's like a hockey stick, it just, it just takes off, right? And, and we are getting ready for that in terms of providing that scale. Yeah. So, our approach to, um, first of all, is to understand the different opportunities across different industry verticals. So if you look at the work that we initiated, we've partnered with companies in healthcare, we've partnered with companies in supply chain, we have uh, actually partnered with the Open Music Initiative so we can understand the opportunities around digital rights management for art for the arts, um, automotive segment, a number of different verticals, just to understand what do these workloads are gonna look like. And again, how do we address the three areas that we're very focused on? And you'll hear us consistently talk about scale and talk about security yeah. and talk about privacy. So I wanna spend a little bit of time there. Um, if you look at, uh, for those of you, I hope you all followed and paid attention to what Rojas said, right? Because he talked about 
some of the challenges with authenticating and authorizing transactions on the blockchain. One of the things that we've been investing a significant amount of time, and in fact, we wrote a blog uh, called The Summer of Consensus, is because the concept of accepting transactions in the blockchain is what can really, uh, it could really impact how distributed your network, I think the gentleman here was asking question about the distribution of networks, about the number of people who can authorize transactions. So we have been spending quite a bit of time doing our own research and working with academia on multiple consensus algorithms. And in fact, if you follow the announcements that we've done over the last summer, a lot of them, a lot of these collaborations have different implementations of different consensus algorithms where you're trying to balance how secure do I want to make my blockchain trade it off against how scalable do I need it to do so it operates at the speed of my business. So we have a set of hardware technologies and specifically one technology called software guard extensions and without getting into too much detail, what it allows you to do is give you a secure enclave where you can inside of the enclave allow your data and his data, they perform a computation inside of the enclave without you having visibility into his data and he having visibility into your data. So it delivers to you privacy and it does that compute at the speed of the processor. The other interesting thing is that you and you agree to the algorithm, this particular al algorithm running on the enclave. Remember the concept of hashes that Rohas talked about? We can actually deliver cryptographic proof that the algorithm that both of you agreed to is the algorithm that's running into the enclave. So this unleashes a number of different possibilities, again, in terms of the privacy the security, and the scale. And you said that this is early. Yep. We're going to be bringing that technology across different processor families depending on how much performance and how much processing you want. Now, I want to make two more statements around our work. So in that, that, that scale security that, that you're going to bring on the processor, and, and ju just, to, you know, uh, just to add to that, I think a lot of the people are also potentially thinking cloud. And, yes. and the fact that these are the chips that run the cloud. Yes. Right? So, so perfect segue. Okay. Let me build on that question because yeah. I think that's really important. Uh, back in the middle of August, we uh, uh, announced a collaboration with Microsoft on their Cocoa, what they call the Cocoa yeah. framework, which is being powered by Azure, and that's really bringing blockchain into the cloud. Since that announcement with Microsoft, we've announced multiple different collaborations uh, with, with many of the CSPs. And behind that is a collaboration specifically on how we're going to do this scale. So one of the things that we demonstrated is a side-by-side -side comparison of an Ethereum network doing the proof of work that Rojas was talking about that's delivering to you 15 transactions per second. With the collaboration with Microsoft and trusting that hardware environment that I talked about, we can deliver doing an apples-to-apples -apples comparison close to 1,600 transactions per second. That's a great example of the power. One other point that I want to make Really, blockchains, there's a lot of work that the technology industry is going to do, but just like you stated, the value to businesses is going to be uh, understanding the business process. I think you also mentioned that. That can leverage from this technology. In order for that to happen, we need to make these blockchains easier to be programmed and easier to be able to replicate or to simulate a real business process in a programmatic way which is why a lot of the work that we're also doing is in the area of smart contracts and enable smart contract development to happen in multiple different programming languages. So whether you like to write in C or Java or Python or Rust, uh, you have the ability to really start driving that business transformation by being able to take in your business process that you're trying to optimize, creating a programmatic instantiation of that and then running it on a blockchain. Great, yeah. So I think we could, uh, you know, we could go on for some time. I have a number of things to share, and uh, you know, I think I could, I could keep asking questions. But uh, you know, with, with such a packed room here, probably, you know, before we get back to our conversation, it's good to ask some questions from 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 people here, uh, because uh, see, essentially, uh, you know, uh, we as technology providers, you know, be it TCS, be it Intel, um, you know, what we are looking at uh, today is to try and scale this, try and bring in fintechs and, and make it easy to integrate create ecosystems and, and see how we can leverage the power of the underlying technology. So maybe we can take a few questions, uh, you know, right now, you know, starting from there and, and then uh, continue the conversation. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Vic. Uh, I know you were stressing on uh, privacy and scalability, but I think uh, we also need to look at interoperability in a sense because everybody is looking at blockchains in sort of silos. 
So how are you solutioning for that uh, today? Yeah. Um, good question. There are a number of different implementations of, uh, of blockchains, for example. Um, Anoop was mentioning uh, the use of Fabric. We're developing Sawtooth. There's other um, uh, ledgers out there, and there's actually an effort around, you know, Interledger is one of the organizations yep. that's trying to help create uh, those interfaces. I think we're still in the early phases on the cross-ledger collaboration, but I know that some of the partners, if you look at the partner list that we've announced uh, over the, during the fall, there's a couple of them that are actually going to, we're going to work together on trying to figure out how we do cross-ledger collaboration. We don't have anything that we're announcing yet, but I do know that a few of other players in the technology industries have already starting to announce uh, their collaborations. We have to start getting into, a, you know, you went, I think you were mentioning AP, the work you did around APIs. There's a lot of uh, significant API work that we're going to have to do. And also, um, today, I know how to secure certain hyperledger sitting on top of my, of my hardware, right? But now when I'm having that cross-ledger uh, participation, how do I ensure that I can deliver the same level of security when perhaps at the other end of that ledger, I may not have the same hardware attributes that I have on this ledger. So a lot of work to be done. Maybe you have something you can add to that. I think you covered it perfect. See the, you know, uh, just to elaborate on that, you know, the key aspects that we are looking at today are interoperability, you know, integration and coexistence, right? I think coexistence is critical. Um, the systems that we have today, the core systems are not going to go anywhere, right? No bank is going to say, I'm going to take my core banking and put it on a blockchain in by fact, next year. In fact, right? I, I, I will I'll bring this up. Why can't we have core banking on on uh, 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 DLTs? Yeah. Why do why do if I have to transfer money to Rick, why do I need to go to a bank and and transfer? Why can't my handset be a node? Why can't his handset be a node and my data and my beneficiaries are on my node and I can do a transfer and then it can reconcile with the bank uh, on on that? Why can't we look in in that uh, manner? Theory I, I yes. think time will yeah. come. Time will As come. I said, is, is there still? Uh, 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 an animal which is still not tamed uh, or, or its entire potential is still not uh, unleashed, but uh, time will come, we can look at why do core banking is required. I don't think so. Yeah. I actually think there's a point to be made on the trans and I'm glad you, you brought up the example of you and I sharing information. We are, we are going to spend a lot of time in the blockchain world working on the infrastructure side. I think the, the holder of my assets, which is a handset or it could be a PC or it's going to be, and it is today, a big area of focus for us because those transactions are going to have to initiate somewhere. And we need to make sure that um, the level of security and the protection of your assets in whatever device you use is really, really important. And in fact, some of these hacks that you've seen around currencies almost yeah. always start in the endpoint. So I'm glad you brought that up because since we're talking to a developer audience here, it's important for you to understand that that transaction initiation is also a point where security and privacy and, so, and not so much performance, but for sure security and privacy are going to be really important and you better protect your businesses and your partner's business, right? Making sure that the Absolutely. transaction initiating yeah. is protected. Next question. What Anup said about, uh, you know, having the transfers between individuals, for example. So predominantly right now it's more into uh, B2B kind of, uh, uh, you know, imp implication of uh, how uh, blockchain is going to be used. But if it's going to be scaled up to a very large uh, segment, B2C, etc., so it becomes sort of uh, has an impact on uh, lots of businesses which are intermediaries in this process yeah. Yeah. who will probably be wiped out because of uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation. So, uh, and probably new kind of, uh, new kind uh, of uh, New opportunities will come up. Come up. Sure. So, yeah. So how is this being considered as a plan for, for blockchain? I mean, what are the kind of uh, uh, views that are there? What kind of opportunities are coming up and what, what will be their impact? As, as I said, uh, it's still in the nascent stage, at least I can say from the India point of while we will grow uh, on, on this. Uh, uh, people like Rick, they, they are hardcore. Like, way I, I, maybe others can answer. I'm, I'm probably, as Roas was saying, I'm not in the category of carpenters, nor I'm an architect like him, but I, I'm somewhere in between. I'm a consumer where I can, I can marry the technology to the use cases and, and kind of a make business out of that. So 
I see blockchain as a platform which has lots of potential, particularly in, in the areas uh, 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 digitizing our land records. Today, that's Absolutely. one of the major use cases. I, I see it Absolutely. in that. Absolutely. Uh, so Any KYC. Any Absolutely, KYC, KYC, KYC is everywhere. another one. In yeah. education, in education segment, if you look at it, uh, uh, like what Singapore University has done, it they have uh, uh, put all the records of their students on the blockchain, and anybody can can fetch them on that. So there are number of use so potential is unlimited, but we are still at the nascent stage. I, I'll give you my experience when I started the blockchain on the supply chain. Honestly, uh, uh, if I had to do, I had to engage IBM, which was fifty thousand rupees per Monday. Or I have to look out for the people at, at the junior level and give them this toy to play, play with it, learn it, and then build it on that. So we are still at the stage wherein we, we don't have those experts, hardcore techies on, on this platform. They are there, but the, it's not, they are not available in abundance. Once those skills are available, the use case will keep on increasing at the faster uh, speed. And just to you know, add to what Anup said, I think consumers are also, in a way, uh, would drive this adoption, right? So uh, you are a buyer of, let's say, organic food. Now, you are willing to pay that 20-30% extra price for buying that organic food, provided you have a surety that this is actual and organic food. Now, uh, how it this, you know, is driving it, you know, on the back of it, if you see the entire agri, you know, value, you know, agri, agri supply chain, it's completely broken, right? On the one side of it, farmers are crying for that they don't get a value for their produce. On the other side of it, consumers are complaining that, you know, the produce is very expensive. Very contradictory, right? You know, and in between you have this entire supply chain which is hugely broken. Now, a consumer has you know, different sets of expectations, right? How do you marry all these things? So I think it's a fantastic use case where, you know, blockchain, the entire agri supply chain can be brought on the blockchain and you are able to trace, you know, to the farm level, at the produce level, what fertilizers, what kind of seeds, what inputs have been used and what kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, modes through it, it is passed through, processed through and while it is reaching to the consumer, you know. So, uh, to an extent, this will all be driven by a uh, lot of needs from the consumers as well. Authenticity, Authenticity is, a, is one of the is major yeah. factors, right? And also elimination of, uh, you know, paper related to that. Correct. Uh, fraudulent paper, manipulation, right? I think in a sense, you know, to the point that you were talking about B2C and B2B, uh, you, you could say that there is potential for blockchain to do to the back office what the internet has done to the front office, mm -hmm. right? So I think it can just B collapse a lot of things, you yeah, know, a lot so of… So B2C yeah. will… my. Uh, we will just may take some time and probably I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, Rick since this part of the Intel how he can ensure that the handset, it, it, will, it will pick up only when your handset which is our key uh, 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 system technology, that becomes robust, secure and, 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 and portable and blockchain can be portable on, on that. So it is our I biggest tool today. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, From at least the, the technologies that we develop for for endpoint devices, mostly mostly in the PC space, but there will be more to come. Uh, for those of you who follow the fintech industry, that was a big part of our thrust at Money 2020 in Vegas. Was that last week? Again, the weeks blur a little <laughs> bit. But we made a number of announcements. The primary focus was on the endpoint on the B2C uh, space. So we made announcements with banks that are using some of the same secure enclave technology that I talked about in the infrastructure is also being applied into endpoints to protect things like your biometrics or your locations or other factors. We're also using it for Bitcoin wallets. We announced multiple collaborations about protecting the keys uh, for your Bitcoin wallets in the device. Um, and we've also announced uh, an interesting organization with the, with the government of Canada around starting to use your device to protect your identity and some of your own assets so that I, as a user, start getting more control of who has access to my data and then who I empower to share my data with others. So there's some really interesting opportunities in B2C and most of them they came from people like you, Anoop, who said, can you help me protect that B2C transaction as it gets onboarded yeah. to something yeah. like a blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. I think there was someone back there who, uh, you know, raised their hand and, yeah. Um, 
So my question is on, uh, you know, the potential of using, uh, you know, the blockchain technology to reduce the, you know, the settlement cycle, you know, when you trade a stock, for example, right now it takes, you know, different market it takes different times, but then, you know, the clearing happens pretty much in immediately, but the settlement takes like a couple of days or three days. And, uh, you know, I think one of the potentials of, you know, using blockchain is, you know, when, you know, essentially each share bond, all of those, you know, effectively become, you know, blocks, you know, those, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, both the clearing and settlement can pretty much take place instantaneously. So is there some work that, you know, in the fintech space that, you know, you have been aware of, is anything going on there? I, I mean, I, I, you yeah. want to take it? So, uh, so uh, first of all, let me kind of a clear a doubt on that. So uh, while uh, you may see the settlement happening in the current technology, uh, uh, you say two, three days, but the institutional settlement happens 4 p.m. the same day. For some reason, uh, when when the customer settles, he gets the details after two days. But you yes, have the you have the pay in and payout yeah, time frame, absolutely, the banking time frame, in absolutely on on that. But uh, honestly, I haven't heard uh, it can be another use case, absolutely in in in, in kind of. In, but I haven't heard anything uh, happening in this space as yet. See, uh, you know the one the one big change is uh, there is a difference between uh, listed securities and unlisted securities, off market OTC securities. So there would be a significant transformation that will come when it comes to what is not on the market. So what is traded on the stock exchange, you know, it's all already electronic today. Yeah. You know, it's been electronic for more than 20 years. The time frames will compress and it depends on where, what you want to do with respect to risk and margining and how much you want to compress the time frame that's available. If you compress it too much, you will lose liquidity, Absolutely. right? I think you need, to, you need to give a certain amount of time for, for, for you to create uh, liquid markets. But the huge risk that is there in OTC markets, in OTC derivatives, those are areas where blockchain, I think, will fundamentally change the way in which settlements take place and uh, dramatically bring down, bring down the risk. Okay. Thank you. And also, on, uh, just to add, you know, there are multiple parties involved, right? You have exchanges, you have broking houses. So there are multiple intermediaries while the entire transaction goes through. A uh, lot of this and post uh, settlement also there's a lot of activities which you know goes behind it all those reconciliations you know uh, blockchain can be very effectively used uh, to you know bring in efficiency on those processes it, it, it's great when you run out of time before you run out of questions i think there were a couple of hands yeah. there you know sangeeta has to tell how one one question she's the one i mean you know that yeah. decides which is the last question my, my yeah sorry uh, my question is that uh, do you see blockchain helping us reduce the transaction costs, particularly for low-value transactions? Today, digital transactions like 1,000 rupees, you spend 5 rupees per transaction is okay. But suppose you want to do a 100 rupees transaction or a 750 rupees transaction. Is it any way blockchain advantageous from, from reducing the cost of transaction to say zero or just 10 paisa for a 50 rupees transaction? It should eventually, as I said. I, I, Intermediaries I, go away. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. Not zero. Um. It, it will come down. It should come down, but it will never become zero. <laughs> Nothing becomes zero, but yeah, I guess, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would like to know um, blockchain usage in the social tech space. Has there been any work done, or is there any use case that you've been working on or heard of? Because we are a social tech company building technology to reduce. Um, you know, uh, b bring uh, transparency, clarity, visibility into social um, in initiatives. So we have Billion Lives, a company called Billion Lives. So maybe I think, you know, digital identity is one of the areas where, you know, if you have more than 2.4 billion people Absolutely. who are, uh, you know, below the kind of, who are poor, right? And for most of them, people keep asking that, who are you? I mean, you know, and because they are not able to answer, you know, that basic question of an identity, the free movement, you know, education, everything, you know, it gets impacted, right? So it's a big area where a lot of governments have taken initiatives where, you know, they've kind of gone ahead in terms of providing e-residencies, creating, you know, uh, some of the countries have started initiatives of creating digital passports. Record you know, keeping. The, the, uh, so those kind of initiatives are, we're seeing those kind of initiatives which can address this basic core question of, you know, who are you? Digital identity. And contact, yeah. Education. That's, yeah, that's yeah. You, yeah. 
well financial institutions generally tend to lead the way you know uh, you know there is there is always the thinking that financial institutions are conservative but financial institutions tend to lead the way in absorption of technology uh, governments uh, e governance uh, you could say um, citizenship services you know these are areas where the application of blockchain is expected to be quite phenomenal yeah, I was just going to say, if you there's an initiative called ID2020 that's been supported by some major players in the high-tech industry. You may want to look there. It's a good place to start.